A tree is a perfect example of a cantilever in nature. Next time you're on a walk, just look at the branches. Or lampposts, for instance, they're cantilevered too. And this parking garage, the ends are cantilevers. Now, cantilevers play all sorts of roles in buildings today, but here's an interesting example of how their use is governed by climate. You may think when you look at North American cities that all the skyscrapers look the same, but it's not quite true. In the northern parts of the continent, cantilevered beams are used more often than in the south. Or why would that be? Well, in the north, with the extremes of climate, the last thing we want to happen is to have our posts or columns unevenly stressed by the changing temperatures. You see, inside the building, there are some columns that go right up the middle, maybe 10 or 20 storeys. They are always cosy and warm. If this set of columns stays warm while the outside ones get cold, there can be more than five centimetres difference in the total length of the inside and outside columns. That's definitely not good for the building. But if the beams in the building are cantilevered, then the outside columns are effectively pulled inside the building where the climate is controlled. In other words, it's a lot easier to keep them warm too. The roof over the stands of this football stadium is a great cantilever. In fact, many stadium roofs use the cantilever to great advantage. Now, I want to show you something important about a cantilever. And once again, I shall turn to my trusty eraser. But now, I'm going to clamp it to the back of this seat and apply a weight to the end of it. And what happens? Well, it scrunches up at the bottom and stretches at the top. In other words, it's tension at the top and compression at the bottom, the opposite to our simple beam between two posts. Now, this is important because we have to make sure that we have enough material and of the right sort at the top of a cantilever to handle the tension. And this becomes critical for those amazing large cantilevers because then we'll use something that's called pre-stressing. Now I'm going to explain pre-stressing by looking at the clever ways in which the builders of some of the world's greatest dams have looked after a similar problem. After all, dams are walls and there is a tremendous sideways thrust on them. So dams are often buttressed, like the walls of a Gothic cathedral. But some dams are very thin. How do they do that? They don't put heavy weights and statues on the top of a dam to keep the thrust line in, like the Gothic designers did. But we know that every push can be replaced by an equal and opposite pull. So suppose we drilled holes right through the middle of the dam, down to the bottom, and put long steel rods down them anchored them to the rock and put great nuts on the top and tightened them up so that now they are pulling down. That is pre-stressing. Pre-stressing is an important principle of construction in many modern high-rise buildings. Now, we see concrete everywhere in construction, but ordinary concrete only works when it is compressed. If you try and bend it, in other words, put it into tension, it tends to crumble. That is no good if you're constructing a skyscraper, or any building for that matter. So how can we make this material work under tension and also be pre-stressed? The answer is to put steel rods in the concrete. If it's a concrete beam, the rods go near the bottom, where the tension will be greatest. In any event, the material with steel rods in it is called reinforced concrete. Its importance to modern construction cannot be overemphasized, and it's reinforced concrete that lets us use pre-stressing. Perhaps the best way to demonstrate pre-stressing is with this pile of books. Now, if I wanted to put this pile on that shelf, say, I could do so by pushing hard on the outside. Mind you, I'd better push in the right place. Too low down and they pop up in the air. Too high up and they fall on the floor. Now, I've said before that for every push, there can be an equal and opposite pull. So, I could achieve the same result by drilling a hole through the books, tightening up some screws on the end, and there we are. It's a bit rough on the books, I know. But that's exactly what I've done. Not only that, I've now turned this row of books into a beam. 
that could span from there to there and take a push on top. And that's exactly what reinforced concrete is. That's why we had steel inside. But better than that, if I were to tighten it up, then I'm actually pre-stressing the beam. That is, I'm building in a stress to push upwards against any loading that I might put on top. And the neat thing about that is that I've locked in a stress and so the initial loading of the beam I get for free. In other words, it's simply relieving the stress that I've already built in. To take this one step further, reinforced concrete and pre-stressing are the keys that let us replace joists and beams with thin slabs in high-rise building construction. Let's return again to our post and beam system, with joists running from beam to beam. In a house, they are usually made of wood. But supposing we were to use reinforced concrete, it would be in the form of a slab spanning between the beams, and you wouldn't need joists at all. The slab would have lots of steel reinforcing along the bottom, running in the direction the joists would have taken. This is called a one-way spanning slab. And just as with beams, if you cantilever the slab, it's more efficient. Now, the interesting thing with slabs is that now for the first time, if you've got lots of reinforcing rods going in one direction, there is nothing to stop you from having a second set running the other way. That's called a two-way spanning slab. You can have four beams sharing the load, and the slab could then be thinner. So we've managed in our post and beam building to have eliminated the joists. But we still have a set of beams that the slab sits on. Would there be any advantage if we could get rid of them? Yes, there would. If you put enough reinforcing in a slab along the line of the columns, you don't need the beams. Why is this important? Well, it means that, say, for a 12-storey building, if you can save 20 centimetres on each floor, you could squeeze an extra floor in the same height of building. And we can make the slab even lighter and thinner by removing concrete from where it's not needed. It's called a waffle slab, because that's what it looks like. So the thrust today is to make thinner and thinner slabs to create more and more stories in the same height of building. All possible because of reinforced concrete. To end this program, let's look one more time at the CN Tower. In a way, it can be looked at as a very high wall or column. They were able to build it as tall as it is because of reinforced concrete and pre-stressing. But the tower owes a lot to our Gothic heritage too. After all, those are buttresses at the base of the tower and those buttresses themselves are battered. Just like the walls that man has been building for thousands of years. You may have noticed that we're halfway through the series and so far we've primarily talked about structures whose forces follow straight lines. But well, we should have to do something about that. So in the next programme we're going to talk about arches and their three-dimensional cousins, vaults and domes. That's not supposed to happen.